Well, good morning, everyone. It's really exciting to be here this morning. Now, my name is George, and I am a neuroscientist, and I've spent the last 20 years of my life studying an enigmatic disease of the brain known as Parkinson's disease. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. But as a scientist, I'm engaged in thinking about complex problems and in training the next generation of scientists to do just the same. And it's from this that I got the idea for my talk today. We must get hyper. What do I mean? Well, you may have heard of the terms multidisciplinary learning or even interdisciplinary learning in order to solve a problem. Well, my idea is that we need a new way of learning, which I call hyperdisciplinary learning. This reconciles the explosion of data that exists in our current age with the idea that we still need a very broad and comprehensive knowledge base to give us the scope for innovative solutions to complex problems. Let me explain a little more. We humans are unique. This is because we have a capacity for abstract thought and an ability to analyse past events. This enables us to set and test scenarios and to think about what might happen into the future as a result of our actions. No other animal on earth does this. We're also unique in that humans have an urge, in fact it's even an evolutionary compulsion to network with other humans, to join our collective minds together in order to share our human experiences. And this has allowed us to develop society and culture and to build a corpus of knowledge, even allowing us to redirect the course of nature the extended human, life, uh, the human lifespan, and it's enabled us to exploit the world's resources for our own, own purposes. But there's a downside to this human uniqueness. Humans are the only animals other than our closest living relatives, the chimpanzees, that will work together in order to kill other members of our own species. And so this is a terrible thing. And it's also true that while we can exploit the world's resources for our own ends, we also have the capacity to destroy everything that's near and dear to us. Consider the number of extinctions that are a result of human activity. And it's an interesting irony that our success as a species has also led us to many of the complex challenges we face in the 21st century. Consider the expansion of human populations which has led to a limitation in resources, human-induced climate change and the ageing of our population, which has seen the emergence of new diseases like dementia and Parkinsonism becoming prominent. Many cancers and also complex health, um, mental health conditions like depression, all really important first world problems. Well, my idea contends that these sort of complex issues requires us to have collective thought. And in order to do this better, we need to move away from single, um, single individual ways of looking at things into more collective ways of looking at things. We need to pursue the intersection of ideas using my concept of hyper-disciplinary learning. Now, the idea of bringing a whole heap of information together to network new knowledge is, is not a new thing. In fact, in third century China, the Wei Dynasty Emperor Chao Pai actually did this when he commissioned his chief Confucian scholar, a guy called Man Shi, to go out and get a book of all the knowledge that existed of the time, from all the learned texts and the philosophical works, into a single anthology. It was called the Huang Lang, or Imperial Mirror. It contained over a thousand different chapters and 40 different sections. And the Roman world also had its ability to network information. Plenty of the Elders Naturalis Historia is an example. This is a compilation of facts about Roman life from over 2,000 authors all put together into a single book. And other civilizations had similar compendia. But most of these works were works of a single person bringing information together. A huge undertaking. Consider John Harris's Universal English Dictionary of Arts and Sciences published first in 1704. This was a compilation of all aspects of art, science and technology, nice and neatly listed in alphabetical order for ease of reference. And historically, it was important for scholars to be proficient in all of the liberal arts and sciences. But as we're all aware, the explosion of information in recent times has made this very difficult. In fact, how much information exists? We've already heard last speaker talking about this. But when Google Corporation in 20, 2010 
decided that they wanted to um, digitise every known publication that ever existed, every known book. <coughs> They estimated that the number of book-like objects was in the order of 130 million books. And from 2010 to 2015, there was an in, in excess of 5 million more book-like objects published, a massive amount of information. And this is just the old-fashioned book. These days, our information and our knowledge is not published in old-fashioned books. To put this into perspective, Cisco Systems estimated that across the internet in 2016, the amount of data that was um, transmitted was in excess of 1.2 zettabytes. And that's seven orders of magnitude in the amount of information in all published books ever existing in, in hum to, to humans. But it's important to recognise, as we've been reminded by Clifford Stoll, that data is not information, Information is not knowledge. Knowledge is not understanding, and importantly, understanding is not wisdom. So how might we best bring these zettabytes of data together to build our collective understanding and perhaps even our wisdom to solve the complex problems we face in the 21st century? Well, I contend that to do this, we need a realignment in the way we train the next generation of scientists. We need to move away from single disciplinary specialties and culturally restricted scientific and technological subject areas and move towards more holistic models of thinking and synthesising information. This is the hyper-disciplinary learning that I speak of, meaning something above or beyond disciplines. Now in history it would have been expected that the thought leaders of the day would actually have a fairly good grasp of a significant quantum of the then known knowledge. But as we've been discussing, this is no longer possible. And indeed, in the 20th century, and now exacerbated in our age of big data, we've started to learn more and more about narrowing areas of interest. And our university degree, degree programs and even our high school curricula reflect this. This is the reductionist aspect of science, where we ask, specific questions and simplified, idealised and controlled experimental settings to get a concrete an answer in absolute terms. And while reductionist science has helped us to learn a lot and has been one of the reasons we've been able to solve many problems, I'm afraid that complex problems require thinking that's outside of this disciplinary box and outside um, you have to be looked at from a large number of angles. So reiter to reiterate what I'm talking about, I want to go back to that um, complex enigma that I think about every day, and that's Parkinson's disease. This year we celebrate the 200th anniversary of the 1817 publication of a small treatise entitled An Essay on the Shaking Palsy by James Parkinson. This is the first description in our Western medical literature of the disease that now bears James Parkinson's name. Parkinson's disease affects over 70,000 Australians and more than 5 million people worldwide. It is an age-related illness and it set, its prevalence is set to double in the next 50 years as the world's population gets older. This has huge economic implications, as in Australia alone, the burden of Parkinson's disease is in the order of $10 billion every year. Now, we know a lot about Parkinson's, but we still can't predict who would get Parkinson's disease. And once they're diagnosed, we can't actually predict what, their pro what a person's prognosis is. And more, most importantly, though, for Parkinson's, we can't stop, slow or reverse the degeneration of the brain that occurs in the disease. But the human development of understanding into Parkinson's disease provides us with a very good template of my argument about the changing nature of knowledge. James Parkinson himself is the archetypal 18th and 19th century scholar. Born in 1755 in the Shoreditch region of North East London, like his father, James Parkinson was an ap apothecary and surgeon and he was a member of the Royal College of Surgeons. But he had an extensive education and very broad interests. And in fact, in his lifetime, he was probably more prominently known for his prolific writings in geology and paleontology, in social welfare and, and in political activism. Now, there's no doubt that his extensive education helped him to hone his skills of observation and his ability to synthesise information. 
These are all attributes that were particularly important in his ability to discover a new disease. And it was in the 20th century that disciplinary knowledge and reductionist science had helped to understand much more about Parkinson's. In the second decade of the 20th century, it was pathologists who identified that the, a pigment in, in the brain was missing in the brains of people who had died of Parkinson's, in an area of the brain called the black substance or substantia nigra. But it wasn't until the 1950s that it was chemists that identified that this region of the brain was very high in a chemical called dopamine. And this allowed pharmacologists or drug scientists to observe the seemingly miraculous effect of replacing this chemical in the brains of people with Parkinson's. This was the topic of a wonderful book by Oliver Sacks published in 1973, Awakenings, which was later turned into a movie starring Robin Williams, who ironically in 2014 died suffering from a form of Parkinson's disease. Now, these pharmacological advances caused a revolution in our understanding of Parkinson's and also provided for the first time treatments for individuals with the disease. And in parallel, neurosurgeons and neurophysiologists were able to show, largely by some um, trial and error in humans actually, and then by some close and controlled experiments in animals, that if you damaged parts of the brain, it could actually improve the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And this went on to be developed into very highly technical neuro, um, neurosurgical interventions for Parkinson's, like deep brain stimulation, where we place small electrodes deep into the brain regions into which electrical stimulation causes pseudo lesions that control or modulate the abnormal brain functions that occur in the Parkinsonian brain. None of this would have been possible without a large number of other technical advances. Take the imaging of the brain, for instance. This requires um, important uh, disciplinary knowledge in physics for the magnetic resonance imaging and high-powered data processing techniques. Did you know that the same algorithms that are used for stealth bombers to find their military targets, a neurosurgeon used to find the targets in the brain that um, are the targets for this delicate neurosurgery. And I'm just talking now about the treatments for Parkinson's. You can imagine the amount of data that's being generated in experiments that are set out to try and understand the cause of the disease. We can now sequence entire human genomes. We can interrogate the way a single cell can read and transcribe the genetic information. We can use the so-called omics technologies to get an idea of globally things like the metabolome, the proteome, the epigenome and so on. Stem cell technologies enable us to culture brain cells from skin cells and to study the inner workings of these cells with high content microscopic imaging that can be automated to produce terabytes of information that can be al analysed by a computer algorithm. We can monitor a patient's symptoms, their movements, and even their actual brain activity in real time with things as simple as an iPhone. You can imagine the amount of information that we might be able to generate using these experiments. But to me, it can be frustrating as a practitioner of science that a lot of the experiments that are being done are being driven by the technology rather than the quality of the question itself. There's an old adage that to someone who owns a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And so it is to disciplinary scientists. For example, to a geneticist, Parkinson's is considered a genetic disease. To a toxicologist, it may be caused by an environmental exposure. To a cell biologist, they will explain it by a change in a cellular process. And to a neurophysiologist, it might all be explained by changes in the connections between areas in the brain. But in reality, Parkinson's disease may be all of these things, and it may be none of these things. In order to solve the enigma of Parkinson's and many of the other complex challenges we face, we don't just need to train more geneticists or toxicologists, pharmacologists, neurophysiologists or even bioinformaticians. In fact, we don't just need to train any disciplinary scientists, but what we do need to do is train more students in the science of how to bring ideas and information together and how to look for the intersections in that knowledge. In many respects, this goes beyond the single discipline, beyond multiple disciplines, and actually transcends the gaps between and across disciplines. This is the hyperdisciplinary learning that I'm talking about. 
Unlike the olden days polymath, whose encyclopedic knowledge could provide the genius to solve the problems individually, today's hyper-disciplinary problem solvers need to work collectively and in teams, and they need to use multiple levels of data and multifaceted approaches. Of course, in doing this, we can't ignore the importance of disciplinary knowledge. This still remains critical. Also critical is our need to adhere to the scientific principles of evidence-based hypothesis testing. Without these things, we will not get far, but we need to go beyond this. Using a reductionist mindset will only get us part of the way when it comes to complex challenges. So, any of you out there who are budding scientists and any of you interested in solving the complex challenges of our age, let me conclude by saying this. We need to embrace complexity and not be afraid of it. We need to look broadly for solutions. We need to take as much of the available information as we can and we need to work socially and collectively to put that knowledge together in meaningful ways. We need to keep asking difficult questions and we need to work together and we need to work collegiately. Now, if carefully practised and perfected, hyperdisciplinary learning will maximise our, evolution, our evolutionary propensity to network information and will help us as humans to save our planet, to protect our fellow species and to avoid disaster and oblivion. Thank you.